Hi everyone, it's Judy. Welcome back to the On Track Podcast. Today we have a fascinating guest who's the Product Assurance Manager for Sophia Space Missions Operations. He works with USRA, which is a subcontractor to NASA Ames Research Center up in Mountain View, California. This gentleman has a background as both a physicist and an instrumentation engineer, and he's doing incredible things to help Sophia, which is in the side of a 747, pointing up at the skies and capturing unprecedented images of space. You're gonna learn about how all the high science that he's involved when really trickles down to people that are in the trenches every day, engineers like you. I think you're really gonna enjoy this podcast with Mr. Zahir Ali. Welcome to All Team's On Track Podcast, where we talk to leaders about PCB design, tackling subjects ranging from schematic capture all the way to the manufacturing floor. I'm your host, Judy Warner. Please listen in every week and subscribe on iTunes, Stitcher, and all your favorite podcast apps. And be sure to check out the show notes at altium.com forward slash podcast, where you can find great resources and multiple ways to connect with us on social media. Well, hi, Zahir. Thank you so much for joining us today. It's a pleasure and privilege to have you with us on the On Track podcast today. Thank you very much. I'm excited to be here. So you and I met up at DesignCon. Um, was it just been a week? It seems like it's been a couple of weeks. But Not very long at all. I know. Um, so I snatched you right away because I attended your keynote at DesignCon talking about Sophia and all of that. But before we jump into all that kind of good stuff that I think our listeners are going to love, tell us a little bit about your background and education and how you got to come to work with, on um, Sophia. So I'm a physicist by training. I went to school, uh, majored in physics, uh, but took a tremendous amount of uh, engineering classes, um, a lot of EE all the way through graduate level. Uh, electrical engineering and nuclear engineering as well. Uh, then went to grad school, uh, thought about getting a PhD, but kind of left with the Constellation Prize uh, instead, and instead went and got a job. I worked at the Nevada test site. Uh, that mm. contract covers operations at the test site and uh, different types of diagnostic and operational support for Los Alamos, Livermore, uh, and other national uh, security uh, uh, entities, uh, the usual three-letter companies, of course, are included <laughs> in that. Um, and then, uh, you know, the opportunity came along. Uh, a program on that side was winding down, and some mentors connected me with uh, somebody, a lady named Helen Hall, who had been a program manager for many years in the weapons testing world, who had gone over to NASA and said, you know, she's got this cool program that's ramping up, and they need people like you. So I had a chat and. You know, what What young geek doesn't want to go work for NASA right? at some point in his life? Truly. Uh, and, you know, we all grow up. One of the first things we do is lie there on the grass in awe of the clouds. And then one night we, we walk outside and are struck, dumbstruck perhaps, by by our view of the stars. Uh, or perhaps it's, it's a, you know, harvest moonrise where the moon looks as big as a basketball and almost as orange. Uh, so, you know, I had a passion for, for astronomy and space exploration and really, as Roddenberry always called it, the final frontier. And so uh, I came along and it's been 10 amazing, almost 10 amazing years working for a company called USRA uh, on the NASA SOFIA program. We're contractors. USRA was created to handle the moon rocks way back when when uh, we first did a lunar sample return in the Apollo program, because hmm. it was decided that no single institution should have custody or, or control over what is really a resource for humanity, the moon rocks. So uh, an association of universities was formed, hence University Space Research Association, uh, to, to create the Lunar Planetary Institute. And over the years, uh, USRA has done a variety of different work for NASA and other organizations uh, around space research. So uh, when we were talking yesterday, you were saying that USRA and, and your work with NASA, that you actually get to sort of occupy a seat at NASA, right? Working at the Ames 
uh, NASA Ames. Yes. So USRA um, on SOFIA, we operate as an integrated program. So mm-hmm. we sit right alongside our civil servant uh, customers and uh, our other customers, which is, are scientists in the general science community. So I, I sit here uh, on site at NASA Ames, pretty amazing place to work. Uh, it's one of those real privileges because I came here as a boy on field trips oh. from where I lived in the Bay Area and then as a undergraduate student worked on Mission to Mars projects that uh, were funded at my university, uh, Cal, that uh, were funded by NASA Ames, and we, we got to come down here and present what we had developed and get feedback. And then, you know, so many years, it's, it seems like every 15 years I end up somehow working around, on or around Ames. Hmm. And so then to be here is, is a real privilege. And what it is is that it's an amazing place where everything is going on from operations to pure science to developing the next generation of instrumentation that's going to fly in space. So exciting. I'm super jealous. I like you. I you know, I think most kids, but I'm a kid of the 60s and 70s and so you know, I watched Apollo 11 touchdown. In fact, I'm such a space geek that I watched the um the Neil Armstrong story on Netflix the other night all by myself. So oh, was a, yeah, yeah. No, they've made a couple of great movies about him recently. Yeah. So this First one is Man was really good. Yeah, I haven't seen that one. There's a new one on Netflix that sort of um, sort of like a documentary, really, like mm. of his whole the whole trajectory of his education career from test pilot, you know, all the way to his passing and footage is unbelievable and really fun so anyways i i think that all of us in this career we definitely have that little inner space geek in us so um which is why i enjoyed your your talk at um, design con so much why don't you touch on that real quick tell it tell our audience um what it was that you were presenting at design con so at design con i was asked to to create a discussion uh that would provide some insight into what devices, uh, everything on the scale of chip design itself, all the way at, you know, up to board design, uh, integrated systems, all the way to, to component uh, and, and, and systems of component level, and how that um, is interesting uh, and relevant in, in fields outside of the development of those items. And my history in uh, both uh, Homeland Security and now airborne astronomy kind of lends itself to that discussion. Uh, I chose to discuss uh, our, my colleague's work primarily on SOFIA. Uh, I'm not an astronomer, I'm an instrumentationalist. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, so I really identify with, with the EEs and the applied physicists, to be honest, more than, than the astronomers. And what we talked about was how over the years, the amazing progress that people have made in the design and architecture of chips, the design and architecture of Im- embedded systems, uh, of uh, board design, um, going from uh, uh, 1D to 2D to three-dimensional architecture on all of those systems, uh, component optimization, uh, component integration, has fundamentally enabled work. Uh, now, I focused on astronomy because, frankly, those pictures are absolutely amazing. They're, st- and they're fascinating. stunning. Stunning. And, and by the way, um, for our listeners, I'm going to throw some links for you that will blow your mind in the show notes. Truly. I think that you mentioned, you know, this imaging that you're getting, uh, that you're getting from space now is unprecedented, right? Because of the technology. That's exactly right. Uh, so space missions are and versus suborbital missions are is actually a very interesting. Uh, how would you say it, they're 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 symbiotic. Uh, space missions, the TRL level, the technical readiness level, has to be basically at the top of the scale for you to want to launch it because you don't get that many chances at launch. Mm. Uh, you know, very famously, when when the Hubble Optic had a, a slight stigmatism. It took a spacewalk to correct it. And we were, frankly, very lucky because it was in an orbit that was reachable. James Webb Space Telescope, for example, is actually going to be at a Lagrange point. So we have never sent a human to a Lagrange point. 
we mm. could get there, but we don't know how to get back. So the concept of, of servicing James Webb is one that has not been developed and has been, and the developers of the James Webb telescope were told, you can't expect any servicing. It has to work the first time. And so what that does is it means that you stop development on the technology that you're gonna launch a decade almost before you launch. Mm -hmm. However, with other programs such as Sophia, because it's a airborne platform, right. it's a 747 with a telescope in it that we fly at night to look at the stars. The name tells you what it is, Stratospheric Observatory for Infrared Astronomy. So we fly into the stratosphere that's above the water vapor, which hugs close to the Earth. The reason we need to do that is because we observe in the infrared and water vapor blocks 80 mm. plus percent of the infrared. I see. So even at the top of Mauna Kea in Hawaii, right, the, some of the most famous telescopes in the world are there, you only get 20-ish percent transmission. However, with SOFIA, when you're above the tropopause, which is the point of altitude at which you get out of the water vapor, mm -hmm. you get 99.99 transmission. Wow. Almost as good as space. So that's the reason uh, SOFIA exists. And what it does is it provides the astronomy community with access to what is called the mid and far infrared. So that's not the type of infrared that you can use to look through your walls for hotspots if you have an electrical <laughs> issue or to or that the military uses, uh, for example, uh, in, in their operations uh, in the field to identify personnel or uh, for tracking of aircraft, uh, et cetera. What this is, is this is much farther down. And it's very important because just like x-rays let you see through material, in infrared you can effectively see through things like clouds of dust uh, mm. to the heart So then, uh, of what's going on. So the analogy I give is that if you think of a lampshade, if you were to take an x-ray of a lampshade, you'd see nothing. Mm. You'd you, you just see straight through it. Right. But with infrared... So with the optical, you see the shade that's glowing. Yeah. And you know some sort of light source is behind it, but right. you don't know what it is. Gotcha. Right? So that would be like molecular dust glowing. Mm. With near-infrared, you can see, for example, a frosted light bulb. But you can't see the filament because the light bulb is frosted. I see. With far-infrared, we can see all the way to the filament. And that's really powerful. That's how you understand how stars form, mm. how systems are created and a lot of other um, very interesting astronomy. Uh, so, so how, why, what, what, is the, what do devices do for that? Fundamentally, what, they, what has happened is that over the years, moving from the first uh, CCD system uh, at Bell Labs mm -hmm. all the way to now, where we have very complex devices, complex architectures, we're bump bonding things together, back shorting the boards for increased sensitivity, you see these complex architectures that are not just on chip, but on the integrated device, on the board, on the PCB, mm -hmm. and, and farther up. That has allowed us to go to a much farther degree of understanding I of see. the universe. It, because all of these images, every pixel represents real data. They're, they're far more than a pretty picture. We can calculate the magnitude of magnetic fields at the center of the galaxy. We're not just realizing that they're there. We don't just know what direction they're going. We have a scale of the magnitude. That's when you can do real science. You can bring things together and rewrite textbooks. And we're already doing some of that Stunning. on social Stunning. I remember one of the slides you brought up, because <clears throat> I came in a little after you had started. You were saying that you can see things sort of at a molecular level, or you can see the structure of the molecules, or what was that that you were talking about? Right. So with one of our instruments, uh, it's called a heterodyne instrument. It works kind of like AM radio. Uh, so you have a modulation of the, of the signal by a local oscillator. Uh, so uh, you, we can, we're already getting into overarching system design, right? And right. of course, you know, the, the detectors are kind of the, the fundamental chip design, but of course the readout electronics, the, a, the analog to digital converters are critical. Those boards are absolutely imperative right. to, to the success of this instrument. The onboard fast Fourier transform systems are, are, are have to be they have to be on board because to pull them out, do a 
to basically a computer do a process and then put them back into the system does not allow the system to function in real time. Mm. All of that has to be board, has to be burned in or at least FPGA level of integration. I see. So, so the, all the different scales have to integrate. Uh, with that instrument, it's called the German Receiver for Astrophysics at Terahertz Frequencies. What we do is we can detect single molecules. So, sorry, single molecular species. What I mean by that is, for example, recently, and uh, I urge folks to look this up online, helium hydride Sophia. We detected one of the earliest molecules known to exist in the universe. That's wild. And verified theories about the Big Bang by doing so. And the, what we can do, it, the way we do it is that we're, look, we're not taking an image. We're looking for what's called the molecular spectrum. So this is the light emission that's intrinsic to that molecule existing mm. and having a non-zero temperature. I that see. output of light is a fingerprint. It is a molecular fingerprint. Every single state of matter has wow. a, a fingerprint. And it's up to us to figure out how to measure it finely enough. Can we get the precision, mm -hmm. right? Accurate and precision are two different things. I'm sure everybody listening to me know that, right? This is a matter of precision. So we, what we do is we take this receiver that's kind of like an AM radio and shrink the bandwidth to an extreme. We have n no imaging capability. All, Even though we have multiple pixels, all that signal is collapsed into one histogram. Mm -hmm. And we tune it to have extreme spectral resolution. That spectral resolution is what uh, enables us to find these molecules uh, right. when nobody else can. And this spectrum is only available to Sophia. That is just completely science fiction land to me, like, that we're there in, I don't know, in, in my lifetime anyways, like, you know, when I was watching, for instance, the, the Neil Armstrong thing, you know, when they see those guys bolted in with stuff that doesn't have a fraction of the computing power that we have today, you know, putting them in a tin can. I was like, those were brave people to get into those those machines. I have a funny story about when you I do? met Neil. You do? Okay, let's yeah, hear it. So I got, I, I got to meet him. You did? And, yes. Um, it was, uh, there were a couple of review committees that were coming through the Sophia aircraft. And I was asked to be there to answer questions. Mm -hmm. So NASA has these very high-level reviews with amazing, amazing experts, people who are, you know, Nobel laureate caliber, yeah. top of the field historically, yeah. that they will ask to come through, review their programs, provide recommendations, opportunities, you know, feedback, basically. What can we, what are we not doing? What can we right. do better? Um, what should we do in the future? Uh, it's great. It's actually a really great system because we're always getting feedback from the best minds available. Right. And there was a rumor that on one of those panels that was coming through on that date, there was an astronaut. Now, we didn't know which one. So, so you know, th this panel comes through and I'm sit standing by the telescope talking to a variety of people. People come through. Can you help me understand how this works, what it does? Um, and so I'm going through this. A couple of gentlemen come up. One of them is kind of short and, and quite and quite senior, white hair. And you know, I get going into my my discussion, and I suddenly realize that I haven't introduced myself. I haven't asked their names. And so I said, you know, by the way, I'm Zahir Ali, and you know, your name is. And so the first person, they're both kind of giggling at this. And I'm like, <laughs> I was like, is my fly open? What is going on? I mean, do I have something stuck in my teeth? Why are they laughing? Um, so the first person who I ha I'm sure he understands, I don't at all remember his name because I shake hands with him. The second person says, hi, I'm Neil Armstrong. <laughs> and I go, ah, I'm shaking his hand. My, I have to pick my job off the floor. And then I'm like, yeah, that's right. Neil would not look like what he does in his spacesuit on my wall when I was five years old. <laughs> he might look a little older. Just a little older, Just yeah. Just a little older, yeah, because That's to me, it's massive, a giant. I had a right? poster on my wall since I was a boy. I know. And, you know, intellectually, you know, to fit in there, they were all oh, actually kind of short. But. Yeah, so to me, funny. He was a giant. I know. Right? You know, he's, That's he's, hilarious. he's larger than life. 
Neil Armstrong. And, and, and so I didn't know this, but he typically didn't take photos with people. But I think he was so amused by, <laughs> by that and by pro- perhaps, he, he, I, I'll never forget, right? He said, you know, keep up the good work, young man. You know, you, I can see you're clearly passionate about what you're doing. And I think maybe he respected the passion because I mean, he, I he was extremely passionate. He was a very private individual, mm-hmm. but he was always very interested in what was going on mm-hmm. with um, space and yeah. research, um, but liked to keep his kind of celebrity in the background. Yeah, Screaming absolutely. Humbling. This comes out in this movie I'm telling you about, by the way. I'm not. I'm now going to have to put that in the show notes. I'm going to have to put the Netflix link or the movie link because it really is, it's, it's uh, you know, and it's completely in line with what you're saying. He hated the public part of his life and he what he loved most really was the engineering um and he did not love being uh the celebrity the first man on the moon he really wasn't looking for that kind of no, attention no, I, he I just think loved he, the he liked he liked being the first man on the moon i think he but liked that he, he didn't liked like celebrity that came with it, yeah, yeah he didn't like being paraded around i think afterwards and yeah. um you know, his family, it, it kind of took a, a toll, right? Yeah. So military officer, test pilot, that's who he was. I know. Yeah. Well, anyways, um, so from, you know, I saw the instrumentation that you showed, like cryogenically cold, you know, crazy high tech instrumentation that was phenomenal and all that. What I thought would be interesting to explore a little bit with you today, because we were talking about this a little on the phone yesterday, is most of our our audience here are are electrical engineers that find themselves laying out circuit boards and doing tests and some mechanical, throwing some solid works. They just are getting you know a variety of things really crossing their their desk all the time. And so I thought it might be interesting from your perspective, kind of you know. Up sort of in the in the land of super high tech and high science, you know, what do you see is how as that tell that technology is developed for really intense applications like infrared telescopes? Um, how does that trickle down into you know everyday technology? Right? How does it trickle down into the market? And how you know what's the well, just go ahead and answer that question, then I have a, a follow-up for you. Sure. So one of the things that's really good to look at, of course, is uh, a publication called NASA Spinoff. Okay. NASA Spinoff uh, is a publication where that comes out yearly about all the NASA technologies that have gone out into the mm-hmm. world. Uh, there are some very important technologies, everything from the shrinking of telecommunications, i.e., this, which led to the cell phone, uh-huh. Also, to things that we don't think about, like autopilot and auto land, which were developed by NASA and then provided to industry as a public product. Mm-hmm. So, spin off is a great place to start if people are curious. Okay. In general, what happens is that these extreme applications drive research to be done because what you can get off the shelf simply won't cut it. Got it. So somebody has to go make it. So this will go to the universities or to the national labs or to certain key industry players who have mm-hmm. expertise and research facilities to to develop. Right. And our programs will get the product of that, and those institutions get to keep the know-how and the capability. Mm-hmm. And that know-how and capability, then they get to leverage into other things, such as IR sensors, uh, for example, FLI, uh, Fly, FLIR, I don't know how you pronounce it, FLIR, which is a company, uh, they they make uh, these uh, sensors for everything from military and police applications all the way to uh, consumer applications mm-hmm. uh, for safety and even make a widget that you can plug into your phone and just have fun with. Uh, so what happens is that these technologies are developed and, and the boundaries of these technologies are pushed because we need to push the boundaries of science right. to be able to learn more, understand more about our universe. Mm-hmm. And then on the back side of that, people find interesting applications in the real world for for these technologies. Right. And what's really interesting is that at the different scales, for example, the, the folks using Altium who sometimes may get uh, may get 
tired, sitting in front of a computer. What is my work going to do? Right. Uh, well, you know, though, that work is extremely important because uh, one, one, I'll tell a little story. Well, years ago, uh, we were, I was in a pro, uh, pro, program review and we were developing something for the field uh, that needed to be used in, in very rough circumstances. And a two-star general got up and said to me, young man, you need to design that so that a drunk or hungover Marine can operate it while being shot at in the middle of the desert. <laughs> and that puts a bit of a constraint on things. <laughs> and it's the work that people do at the board level, at the power management level, at the thermal management level, mm -hmm. you know, with the tools uh, to simulate those things, yeah. uh, with the you know creating novel architectures, taking that two-dimensional PCB and folding it into three dimensions so it can fit into the right-sized box mm -hmm. that enables us to put our really fancy widget into a package right. that can fit into the 70 pound maximum pack right. for a marine in the field or uh, I forget exactly how heavy the space suit is uh, but it, those you know, that packs can fit by the way suit. I went to ha I'm gonna interrupt you for a moment those packs 70 pounds right that is that what the the limit is Absolutely. i tried to pick one of those up at a hacker thing oh my gosh it like would tip me over i can't believe that our marines like schlep around with that many pounds of right, right. stuff and it's all back. critical equipment it's, it's been shaken down for the it has been shaken down so anyway sorry <laughs> so so when you're designing for that and again that of course translates into shrinking shrinking your consumer devices mm -hmm. uh so many widgets that we have these days um, that and and integrating them into into single units. So there's a lot of power in in the work that's being done with the simulation tools because they allow, enable us to prototype more rapidly. Yeah. They enable us to do that testing in software. And when you get a when you know I used to work at one one of our labs at the Nevada Test Site, we would get requests that say, look, you have to accomplish this mission. We need this device in three months, uh, and it ha you know, you get the size, the weight, and the power capability, and that's it. And you have to make it work. And there could be lives depending on it. There could be national security yep. depending on it. Uh, so these things matter in the real world. Um, you know, and eventually it turns into how can you sell, how can you create the cooler toy? How can you create the cooler cell phone? How can you create the cooler uh, widget for, for your tracking your fitness or your bicycling? Right. Yeah. There are all these applications, but they come from that integration and and work that's being done on on computer. Yeah, it, it's absolutely true. I always, in fact, I wrote a blog a long time ago, call, a long time ago, called R E S P E C T, the PCB. <laughs> you know, because it's like all the computing power of those amazing chipsets and the devices, everything rides on and depends on that PCB. But when you're an engineer and you're trying to scrub a bomb and find components to go on the board you know it's like you're stuck in the trenches which is why I so wanted to bring you in today and sort of re-inspire our designers and um, reinvigorate them with the exciting things the technology they do really gets to um, you know really enables everything we do yeah one of my professors said <clears throat> something that I think applies a little bit here he said that uh God made heaven and hell. The devil made the made the interfaces, and, <laughs> and 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 to some extent, that's what the PCB is. It's the interface between different different levels of complexity, different levels uh, of of functionality, and and it's 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 challenging. It's really challenging it's very that challenging. layer. Yeah, it, it for sure is. I I saw something on LinkedIn that cracked me up today too. Somebody. Had put something up and there was data, something didn't involve data. And a guy made a comment and he said, you know, the post said something about, you know, always check your data or something like that. And the guy wrote in the post, um, oh, I'm gonna forget it. It's like, in God we trust, but give me data or something like that, like, uh, you know. <laughs> For everything else, give me data. That's what he said. That's he right. said, "In God we That's trust." Right. For everything else, give me data, right? So it it's you know it can be tedious, but it's um, 
fascinating and exciting work, which is why I love being part of it. So from your perspective, way up there in the clouds in the 747 Airborne Telescope land that you live in, um, since you do have a background as an EE, and um, if you were to give an EE advice today, um, you know, looking at these really complex systems, what, what's one piece of advice you might offer? I think what is going to be increasingly important as we move forward is modularity. Mm. Now, most engineers have a little bit of this ingrained in them. Mm -hmm. But I think in our modern uh, consumer device driven lives, we kind of are, are in, we were a little bit in a disposable economy. Yeah. But I think what's going to happen as we move forward is that that's going to start changing. You can see that changing in in software already, but I think it's going to come back in hardware. Uh, because there are some things that are just going to be challenges to integrate. It, you're going to be limited in power because we don't want to accept things to get bigger. We like about the size they are now. Right. Um, in fact, we might even want them smaller. We might even want them integrated into our person for yeah. that matter. That's a little freaky, uh, but yeah. Yeah, I know, you know, <laughs> you, know you will be assimilated. Yeah. Um, but, but what we found um, in our experiments is that modularity and, and upgradability on the hardware side has been critical for the longevity mm. of, of systems and capabilities. And I think what's going to happen in even into certainly into commercial and, and likely even into uh, consumer spaces is that there will be a demand for the ability to to upgrade things as you go. And I think we're seeing this with Tesla already. Oh, for uh -huh. example, uh, you can the hardware is there, but they but you can buy whether or not it's enabled, like with the auto drive. And then what's also happening is that as they make certain changes and, uh, and to the software, the hardware may no longer be as capable. It may actually be incapable of running that level of software. For, mm -hmm. for example, the artificial intelligence, auto drive, I think mm -hmm. it's level five now perhaps that they're up to. And what they're doing is they have made it so that those particular components at the hardware level can be swapped out. And then the new hardware, and then the new software can be enabled. And so what this means is that you bought this car, but it's upgradable. And this is more than just kind of the hobby upgrading, but this is real fundamental capabilities. Right. Which you've never yeah, had Yeah, auto driving, that's terrifying. <laughs> right, so. You know, we'll see, it's we'll gonna be see. a brave new world. I know. Uh, that, you know, but that that's a good comment. No. Because what's going to happen is I think as engineers, as scientists, we're going to be asked to help enable and manage really what is going to be a brave new world. What happens when our cars are not just transportation areas, but are basically extensions of our home? Mm. You have a bath, you know, everybody has a bathroom and, and a table and, and a small kitchen in their car, suddenly. It's now a mobile room. It's not, it's not what we traditionally think of as a vehicle. Right. And yet it's going to move us. It's going to take us from one place to another. Right. So there's going to be a lot of emphasis on, on, on interconnectivity, uh, both physically and wirelessly. So those are a few trends that I see that I think it will be fun for for engineers to be keeping an eye out for and to see how they can get involved. Yeah, good advice. I like that one. Um, so as we get close to wrapping up here, is it here? So sort of from your seat in the house, you know, as we look sort of with an eye to the future, what are some trends you're noticing or what do you think that brave new world is going to look like, you know, as we sort of gaze ahead and think about what we can expect? So there's one interesting piece of data, um, you know, and we will trust in God and, and for everything else we'll have data, <laughs> uh, is that right now the average person interacts with about 1.7 IoT devices per day. How many? 
1.7. So this is an average. Okay. So it's about okay. one, a little, okay. you know, almost two. Okay. In the next five to 10 years, that's going to go up to 10 or more. So this is an order of magnitude. Wow. Right? This is a 10x. Mm -hmm. Yep. So this is going to change things. Mm -hmm. It's going to mean that there's going to be a huge emphasis on, on board and device design for IoT. Mm -hmm. That's going to be really intense. Everything is going to want to be smaller, more capable, eke every nanowatt you can out of it. Right. You've got to handle that thermal, the thermal issues. So this is going to be, there's going to be a lot of work. It's going to be really fun. It's also going to be really challenging. Yeah. On the other side of it, you now have the Hoover Dam breaking open and you've got the lake spilling out. That's the amount of data you're going to have versus the trickle we have now relative to it. Right. And how are you going to handle that? So edge processing hmm. is going to be perhaps, it may be the most important thing. If not the most, it will be one of the most because you're simply not going to be able to pull all that data back to your database and handle it there. What you're going to need to do is you're going to need to do different levels of processing at the edge, at the mesoscale, before you get it back to the back to back to the central right. uh, system so this is you know so edge processing cloud processing yeah but really when you're talking about edge and media and and near edge you're putting the emphasis on the hardware you're putting the emphasis on the board design on the chip design what can you do there at that level mm -hmm. and so I what I what I see happening is there being a huge demand for that capability, which will, of course, uh, drive R&D uh, and research. Yeah, it's, it, it will be, I can't imagine the amount that just since we've covered technologically, just since I started in this industry in the 80s, you know, what we have now would have appeared to be science fiction technology today. So to totally. take that same kind of leap, you know, it's um, compounding, you know, it's, so it'll be interesting to see how we face, you know, the enormous amount of data, you know, Starlinks being thrown up in space. Oh, by the way, before we close, since you're in the astronomy world, um, what do you hear about the concerns about sort of seeing through all the, the space debris um, and to being able to gaze into the universe and do that, that science? It is gonna cause a challenge. Okay. It just simply is. Yeah. Um, now, for the bigger facilities, less so. Okay. But for the medium and small scale facilities, and of course, the hobby astronomer, we are, to some level, polluting the sky. Interesting. And so, this is going to have to be managed. Uh, I think that the initiatives that uh, the U.S. has taken are positive. Uh, a lot of people are skeptical about the need for for addressing space with its own agent, agency besides NASA. But fundamentally, we're gonna need to figure out what, what the heck we're doing up there. There are different programs that are already working on managing space debris, um, orbital debris, and there are also industry solutions to cleaning it up, which is all good. Yeah. So so it's, it, it's like any other exploration and advancement. But in my opinion, it's actually better. We're gonna do it better this time. Will we do it perfect? No. No. We're humans, we don't do perfect. But we're gonna do it better than we have in the past because we're already thinking about these things before before it's really a problem. Well, and yeah, it, I, I, I agree with you, right? We're, gonna, we're not gonna start from the beginning. We've learned lessons along the way that hopefully exactly. we'll apply there, you know, more quickly than, than in the past. A company that, um, that I had the privilege to interview is called um, Orbit Fab. They're a startup and they've developed uh, a refueling capabilities for satellites. So their whole thing is that's gonna cut down dramatically and that's you know already being whatever, they hit, they're in their C round or something of raising um, venture, but they're doing quite well. So, you know, like gas stations in space, like. Yeah, it's, it's amazing what, we're going to have to do and the, yeah. the thing that's cool is the creativity of people around it exactly uh, it's just remarkable and what 
will happen is that we're going to get organized because we're we're we there's somebody been somebody off world continuously for 20 years that's awesome it right? is the awesome ISS and wild i can't even believe success. it's been 20 years but that's so we're wild. there to stay we are there to stay yep. we're there to do more and we're there to push human capability and fundamentally so much of that depends on the scale of devices right. and the scale of systems uh, that work is just not going to go away. In fact, it's going to get more important and it's going to grow. Well, you either have really depressed people or totally inspired them. Maybe a little of both. <laughs> you know, I, I think the more we do up there, the better we're going to be here. That's one thing that people don't sometimes forget is that if we figure out a way to be hyper-optimized with water in space, right. we can apply that technology to Earth. Absolutely. If we figure out new power sources we can use in space, we can apply that technology to Earth. Yeah. So all the winds in the in the harsh environment uh, are going to be applied to to our home world. Yeah. And that's exciting as well. It is exciting. Well, Zahir, this has been a blast hearing from you, and um, thank you so much for joining us today and sharing all your insight and wisdom and. Um, congratulations on an amazing career and a great talk at Design Con. And um, we'll hope we'll talk to you again soon. But thanks so much for sharing Sophia with us and all the work and hopefully inspiring our audience of engineers here on the OnTrack podcast. Thank you very much, Julie. And, you know, good luck to everybody. And please uh, don't hesitate to connect with me uh, on LinkedIn, C A L I. Very good. Sahir Ali. Okay, well, for our audience, thanks so much for listening today. We hope that that inspired you and got you to get your little space geek out and, and enjoy this talk with us here today. We will see you next time. Please remember to like, subscribe, and comment so we know what to share with you next time. Until then, remember to always stay on track. <laughs>